Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. A familiar face on television and film from fan fave Moesha, Madam Secretary, This Is Us, most recently CBS's Code Black, and films like A Soldier's Story and District 9. But it, literally, it's his work behind the scenes that changes lives. I am so delighted to be joined by my friend, and I am a huge fan of William Allen Young. Nice to have you with me. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You have a really interesting background. You actually graduated from USC. You have a degree in rhetoric, a debate, and forensic sciences. But you also have a master's in sociolinguistics. I'm sorry, William. What is sociolinguistics? <laughs> I get that a lot. I bet. Uh, I was interested in studying, as an actor, obviously, people and behavior. And I wanted to extend that into understanding communities groups of peace, people. So I wanted a degree in language studies and sociolinguistics is basically the study of societies throughout human history by studying the languages that they used. So you have to be a, a linguist on the one hand and an archaeologist on the other hand or just trying to figure out what made people uh, uh, behave the way that they did so that you can understand history better. So all of this was apart from being an actor but the but the overlay was that if I understand people in ways that we don't usually uh, 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 challenge ourselves to understand, if I ever play certain characters and need those moments, I can use them. And it's amazing in, in studying social linguistics how much I learned just about how we behave, not just as individuals, but as people, as societies, as nations. And when you think about what's going on in the world now, that, that becomes really important. So that's why I chose social linguistics as a, as a major. I imagine it's fascinating how mm -hmm. people are, uh, don't communicate. But, you know, you come, I mean, obviously going to USC, et cetera, seems rather illustrious and prestigious. But you, as a young man, yeah. came from a completely different background, and you never shy away from talking about that publicly. Yeah. Yeah. So as a youth, it was pretty tough for you. Yeah, it was. I, I'm from Washington, D.C., and but I grew up right here in South Central L.A., right in the heart of Watts. And I grew up in Watts at a time where there was a lot of civil unrest. In fact, I was a child during the, the 65 riots. So, so that was our living. We, we knew we didn't have much. We just sort of made do with what we had, but we had great dreams. And there was a tree in our neighborhood on uh, McKinley, and we called it the McKinley Giant. Nobody could climb it. So that was the challenge, and you sort of put your notch where you last climbed. I finally climbed the tree one day, and when I did, Maria, I was able to look over the houses and from my vantage point, I could see bus uh, uh, buildings in the background. They were red brick buildings. I had no idea what they were. But I grew up wanting to go to USC because I used to see it on the one television that we had in the home, a black and white TV. And they had the USC Trojans playing football. And for some reason, I made the leap that I wanted to go to USC. I didn't even know USC was in Los Angeles. And I, there were nine people in, in my family, and we slept in two rooms, and, and sometimes we'd have to sleep together in the same bed. And I remember they'd say I'd talk in my sleep about these dreams I had of getting places. Well, flash forward, I end up going to USC and realizing, of course, it wasn't far from where I lived, but in my mind, it was a 1,000 miles away. So when I run into young people who are dreamers, or anybody for that matter, I always think about them dreaming about these distant uh, uh, goals and I always tell them you can get there and and you can get there in ways that you you can't even imagine right now so don't lose sight of that vision whatever those red bricks are whatever it means to you eventually keep that image in mind because that's what's going to drive you to get there and as a kid I, I never complained about my condition we started out in the in the projects the Nickerson Garden housing project we didn't know to complain because that was our world and everybody lived in the same circumstance. But as I dreamed, I always knew there was something else and I didn't know how to get to first base. But I just thought if I keep the vision in mind and I meet the right people, I'll get there. And that's been the story of my life. Why didn't you get angry? In my, my house, we, we grew up in a very spiritual, grounded home. And so we were never taught to be angry in a way that caused us to lash out. But you anyone. saw so much anger yeah. when you were when you saw the race riots Absolutely. in Watts. Why yeah. you know 
did you understand where that came from? Well, my question to my mother, and it's, it's in, in, in a book that I'm working on, was we were watching it one night, and what we were watching it was not only from the burning buildings, but we also saw the perspective of white folks that were in other states who seemed to be angry at us for some reason. And of course, the, the, news, the news media was picking that up. So we saw those images on TV in juxtaposition with looking at right around the corner from my house. We could see our house <laughs> and, the, and the fires around it. But in juxtaposition, my question to my mother was, Mama, why do they hate us? So it wasn't anger so much as it just, we didn't understand what we had done. Uh, and so my mother didn't have an answer. Uh, she certainly didn't articulate it to us at that young age. But I think that one of the things that we got from us was that everybody doesn't. And those who don't, don't know you. So your job then, son, is to show them who you are. And so even if that's a naive belief that once you've shown them who you are, that then they'll change their minds, it was at least a belief that I followed. And so to this day, I consider myself an ambassador, not just of myself and my immediate family, but of my people. And, and, and my people may be the people of Los Angeles, the people of California, certainly if I represent my country, then America. But I am that ambassador. And that's from that early training that says, no, turn it around. Don't get angry with them because then we just have people fighting in the streets. Be the ambassador that transformed thinking because if you do that, then that's your footprint on the world. Nobody will remember the man or the woman who battled in the street so much as they will remember Dr. King, so much as they will remember Mahatma Gandhi, so much as they'll remember Mandela. The, the world changes, the game changes. And I think we have to, at the end of the day, decide who we're going to be. And that was, that's who I decided to become. Just even that is enough to be a powerful statement to influence people in your direct sphere or those yeah. who witness you. Yeah. Um, and I have been benefit to that. But you've actually stepped even further into, you know, being that ambassador. Um, you've obviously worked in the entertainment industry for years, but you also worked to make the television industry a more fair place. Mm -hmm. So you are part of the group that helped broker um, while you were serving as co-chair of the African American Steering Committee of the Directors Guild, the 2000 TV network agreement yeah. to help balance things out. We're struggling yeah. still with those issues now, but what was that agreement and why was it so landmark? Well, one of the things that we wanted to try to do was to have an agreement with the networks that would help to diversify the roles of, of writers, directors, uh, producers, uh, actors in the entertainment industry, particularly in Hollywood. But we wanted it to have teeth, which meant, meant that it had to have a way that we checked. Uh, there was a check and balance system where we monitored it. And, and, and as a result of it, we actually began a system where the studios and the networks were given grades each year. And it was, it was publicized, certainly in the LA Times. They began to show Disney, Paramount, MGM, whoever it was, uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, here's how they're doing. And that grade represented not so much that they had arrived, but any progress that they had made. Uh, we just felt that if it didn't have the teeth in it, that the industry would basically just sort of slip back into what they had been doing. So there was a lot of fanfare, a lot of pictures taken around the signing of the agreement, but more importantly, we were saying, let's see where we are five years from now. So th there was discouraging news at times, there was encouraging news at times, but at least we would know how we were doing. So we could always maybe push a little bit, to, uh, put a little fire under the studios and the networks who had fallen back, and maybe they weren't aware of it. So they could actually use that as their own test for whether or not they were making progress or to say we can do better. So I, I was honored to be a part of it, but I was more concerned with where we would be five years from now. Would all of that work that we, we did a lot of work to bring everybody to the table, first of all, just to get everybody to the table. The Directors Guild was really helpful with that. The Screen Actors Guild was helpful. The Writers Guild, all of the guilds were helpful. But I was just amazed, and this was a big part of what I played in it. My influence in the, in the business, my relationships with people allowed me to pick up the phone and make a phone call to say, listen, we need you at the table. And so I, I used whatever influence I could to get people at the table. And once the agreement was signed, then we had everybody's fingerprints on it. Now we began the process of tracking it. 
20 years later? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I just think that it's, it's an industry that is slow to make a lot of progress because I think that it has systemic issues that it has to deal with, but it always functions on the bottom line. And the bottom line is those things that get ratings, those things that make money are going to get produced. The problem is, and I've been on the, on the side of pitching ideas for shows, there are barriers even in the room for what they perceive to be a show that can get good ratings, uh, that can uh, 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 you know, do well at the box office. For example, years ago, we, right now, we're, we're blessed to see women working in lead roles in movies uh, and, and, and television shows. That wasn't the case that long ago. And when you pitched an idea and you said, there's a woman in the lead here, the first thing they would do, and you could feel it, they say was, we assume that show will not be watched by people. Well, why do you assume that? So that's what we were trying to do, was to knock down the barriers of just the assumptions that we felt were wrong. Give it a shot. So we've actually gotten some of the network folks to to change their minds only because they said, well, we'll try this. Maybe that meant you get a lower budget. That's okay. We'll make the point that we're trying to make. And once that point was made, now women see a breakthrough in those roles. They could do it all along. They had the capacity and the talent to do it. It's just that the industry has to be made to believe that those things can make money and get ratings in the same way as uh, other shows. Well, if only that would change as fast as the technology that it's allowing us to watch all of that. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, you have actually, beyond your work in the entertainment industry, you know, you've taken that one step further to be able to help the next generation um, take a courageous, dreamlike approach to their life. Yeah. So you created the Young Center. Yeah. Um, what exactly is that, and who participates? Why did you do it? I mean, the, the list of questions here is as broad as the yeah. organization itself. So what is the Young Center? I, I, as I said, I grew up in South Central LA and I remember I was doing well and I had finished doing a film in Europe and I was living in Paris for a while. So I came back from Paris, I had a lot of money in the bank and I came back to speak at my high school, Locke High School, right in South Central. And I just looked around in the community and I just thought, I, this is just unacceptable. There were students who were tr truant and just hanging out in front of the schools. There were no youth centers. They had closed them all down. There were no uh, theater groups that, that I took advantage of when I was a kid. There no arts. No, everything just seemed to have disappeared. And in the absence of it, there seemed to be no leadership at all. So what I did was I took my own money and I started what was then the Young Foundation. And what I did was I recruited an army of, 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 of teachers, uh, college students, retired professionals, parents, uh, to go into the schools, especially the schools that have been identified as failing schools. And we said, no, we're not going to let these schools fail. So the foundation uh, pulled together this all-volunteer army and we went into the schools to save them. We tutored and we mentored, stu mentored students who were failing and the system just didn't have the time to deal with. And we saved them from failing. We had a 98% success rate. Those students went on to graduate. So we set up a scholarship uh, fund. That was all my money initially until I got corporations to, to buy into the vision. And we gave uh, college scholarships to students, need-based scholarships, academic merit scholarships, so that they could go on and continue their education. I wanted to create or help create a culture of success in communities where there just seemed to be this culture of death and this imminent, I am not going to live past 21. I found that unacceptable. I said, no, I lived here. And, and I can't alone do this, but I can begin something. That was the Young Foundation. We partnered with the LA Unified School District to deal with initially 13 failing schools that they had identified. They called them the priority staffing schools. We went in and we turned it around. So they asked if we would expand it. And I said, it takes a lot more manpower to do that. But we agreed to expand it to 21 schools. Then in 2000, after we had done free breakfast programs, uh, after we had done the tutoring mentoring programs, we opened up the, the, uh, the Young Center for Academic and Cultural Enrichment, which was housed on the, on the campus of my alma mater, USC. And what we did was we said, now we are going to develop the future leaders of these communities because we don't have leadership and you need that to sustain it. So we started a program called the California Youth Think Tank. 
and it was a leadership development program. And we recruited students from all over California, primarily students from underserved communities. And we built up a think tank. And every year they identified and addressed and proposed solutions to the challenges facing the youth in their community. And what we did was we to took youth ambassadors from that group and we went up to, to Sacramento. And we met with the governor. We met with the legislators who dealt in subcommittees with education, with funding and all of that. And the young people, speaking on behalf of the youth of California, presented their proposals after all of their research, their deliberation, their citywide debates, they came up with their solutions. And we got a chance to get them to Sacramento where they presented those to the legislature and, and the Department of Education and said, now what are you going to do? So the, the difference was, Maria, was that it was generated as a, as a grassroots effort and it came from the young people. So these obviously were the youth leaders, but these plans were not only uh, uh, nice that they developed them, but a lot of these plans became policy. Do you recall anything particular? That well, the, the one that comes immediately to mind, for which our students won from the um, California Association of School Counselors the Advocate of the Year Award. The students took up the issue of, of, of uh, lack of counselors in public schools, and so they took that on and said, we want to change that. Our students worked for two years on a program because they realized one of the biggest issues was money. And so they said, we're going to find a way for them to do it without adding a single dollar to this. And over two years, they worked with their local representatives, with their mayors, uh, in, in research together at USC with other uh, college students, and they came up with a five-part plan that would help to get schools more counselors that had few, and some schools that didn't have any counselors to at least now have counselors back in. That included psychologists. In that plan, which they presented to the governor, then Jerry Brown, that they presented to the Senate and the legislature, there were two planks that were instrumental in helping, at the time, I don't know if you remember, the LA Unified School District was in a contentious uh, 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 negotiation session with, with the unions. And that was one of the loggerheads out of school positions, funding out of, I'm sorry, out of classroom positions, right. counselors. So the, 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 uh, the union wanted them and the board had pushback on it. So it was, the, the whole negotiations were being held up. We sent them a copy of the five-part plan that our youth ambassadors had presented to the governor and to the legislature. They borrowed two of those planks and that became the, 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 uh, the issue that turned the whole negotiations. Within one week, they finally finished the negotiations, they worked it out, and if you look at the plan, almost verbatim, the language that was used to incorporate funding for counselors is from our youth ambassadors. 14, 15, and 16-year-old kids, wow. young adults, wrote that. And so we teach youth empowerment, not just as curriculum and something nice to teach in the classroom. You do need le youth leadership training programs. But that came to fruition. They actually created positive change. And so that's what the California Youth Think Tank is about. That's what the Young Center is about. It's taking young people, training them to become, as we call them, the future leaders of our society. But we say that training has to begin somewhere. And it's not happening in our schools. It's not happening in our other places where, where it used to happen. So the Young Center, not singularly, has taken that on as our mission and as our vision and goal to cultivate a new generation of leaders for positive social change. And, and, and that's, it, it, it's something I'm passionate about, but it's something that more than that, we need. Every grassroots movement, every revolution in the world has started on the backs of young people. We were talking about Hamilton earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexander Hamilton was 19 years old when he came here. Now, obviously, all of the people around him, these great people, they were young, relatively young, and yet they led a revolution. So I think that one of the things that we have to do is to remember to look to the youth. Don't overlook them. Don't shut the doors without inviting them into the room. Those are our youth ambassadors. Because their input is not only valuable, their energy, their belief, their passion is something that cannot be equaled. Now, more than ever, 
I mean, you're talking about the struggles that you encountered. You're talking about the struggles of what inspired you to do this. But it seems as if history, if not resolved, has a tendency to repeat. So mm -hmm. now we're in that scenario again. I would imagine something like what you're doing would be looked at, perhaps replicated, uh, used as a model, maybe not exactly you know, mirrored, but yeah. what you're talking about seems to be what so many uh, people in civic authority are talking about a need for, yeah. um, backing off on police on campuses and adding you know, community members, yes. uh, talking to yeah. the youth and trying to determine what it is that they are looking for and what they need. Because they are getting out, they are walking, they are saying they're they're, you know, they're communicating with each other, but Absolutely. with what you're saying, there needs to be a plan and action that goes along with that. Yeah. Are you noticing that there's more focus on the Young Center? Are people starting to reach out to you and say, how did you do this and can we replicate it? We, we, we do, we, we have noticed that in the last year or so. Yes. And I think that it's because of what you said, Maria, people are looking for answers. I do believe that there is a sincere interest in try to, trying to figure things out. I think that the current protest in our country is telling us that there's so much that we haven't figured out. So if people embrace that at least, then we have to go to second base, which is how do we do that? How do we do, are things in place already that we can borrow from? But we certainly know that we need to open up the doors of communication. And we certainly have to invite, in terms of it, it, inclusivity and diversity, we have to invite all of the players to the table. Because we cannot solve this without everybody being a part of it, or at least feeling a part of it. Uh, so the Young Center is be beginning to take more of a center stage, especially for the component part that we deal with, and that's the training of young minds. Uh, that alone will be a piece of the answer. But to me, it's one of the most valuable pieces. It's not a pawn on the table. It, it has rook status. It has bishop status, if not queen or king. Because ultimately, I think that everything that we do affects the lives of young people. Wouldn't it make sense for us to turn to them, not for the final decision, but to certainly have a say in this from their perspective. If we look at the, the people who are in the streets now in protests, uh, especially the nonviolent protests, those are young people. Not alone, they are backed by elders, but the, the forefront are young people. That's the energy driving it. So I think that when we begin these new discussions, we have to incorporate that next generation there. The Young Center certainly, uh, as it's constructed now, can do a lot to, to be a, a, a critical piece in that. And we're already up and running. For 20 years now, uh, we've done it. And it, the current mayor of Stockton, Michael Tubbs, who is a shaker and a mover, and is now doing universal basic income and other revolutionary things, uh, he was with us for four years. Michael Tubbs is one of my students. And Michael Tubbs came through at a time where he ha didn't have a clue as to where it was going. He simply said, Mr. Young, I want to make a difference. He knew that. That young man went on to Stanford, full scholarship, went on to become the mayor, the youngest mayor of a major city in America. And Michael Tubbs is one of our examples. Felipe Hernandez, a young Latino kid who came from the Barrios of East LA, uh, he went on to become a Marshall Scholar, went, traveled over to the UK and started working on policy for, for immigration because they had some challenges there. A lot of what he did now has become language and policy. He came to us as a 13-year-old kid who didn't, didn't know what he wanted to do. He just knew he wanted to make a difference. Zephanie Smith, one of the most um, prolific speakers on women's and children's rights at the United Nations. Zephanie Smith was with us for four years and came back and taught in our program. So we have lists, and the list goes on and on, of the young people who came to us as 13, 14-year-old kids who ended up changing their world and, and leaving their footprints. So we have in place the mechanism where we have taken young people who certainly didn't know what they wanted to do, ultimately, specifically, but they knew that they wanted to make a difference. And we had the mechanism in place to work with them, to track their trajectory, to get them into college, to, to write those letters, to get them to second base. They then took their ingenuity and went to third base, and they're bringing it home. That process is invaluable, and I just don't see it in place, Maria. Not in schools and, and other programs, but the Young Center stands as one of the organizations that's committed to doing that.
I've heard you speak to young people, and it's always a, a very uh, enlightening experience for a couple of reasons. First of all, your capacity to actually not inject everything, uh, you know, that your way is the only way. But something that you do, did say that I thought was uh, really interesting, that you tell them to accept their role, accept their own story, accept their story as mm -hmm. it doesn't have to look like your story or my story or anyone's, yeah. accept their own story, own it, and then they can move forward. Yes. I mean, one, one, one of the pillars that we stand on is the, the firm conviction that uh, the lives of young people begin to change the moment they realize that their lives have value and purpose. And for Michael Tubbs and the rest of the, the, the young people that I mentioned, and certainly the thousands of young people who come through our programs, that's what we see. We get a chance to see the light turn on. And that's a moment where you realize that they finally get it that they're not just a rock or a stone that was just placed here to soak up the sun, that there is meaning in their lives, that they have power, and that power can be willed in a very positive way to affect what we need, and that is change. Uh, so that when we talk about the change that is needed in the world, somebody has to create that change. We tell young people, that's your job. Uh, one of the things I've always said to parents and, and to the adults, that generation above the, the, the heads of the children, is we have a responsibility to help these young people become the leaders that we say that they are, these future leaders. And in doing that, we have to understand that they will go as far as we inspire them. They want to do something. Their, their, their cannons are loaded. They just don't know how to aim it. Where, and so sometimes it can become destructive. But in those cases, I would question the leadership. How are we helping to guide that? So in our program, our students come from all over. They come from the projects of, of Los Angeles and, and outside of San Francisco. And, and students from 13 states, Maria, have participated in our programs. And one of the states is New York. So we get them from Brooklyn, and we get them from the Bronx, and they fly to take across the, the, the country to take part in our residential program at USC. But all of that input tells us it doesn't matter where they come from. They're all the same. They all are saying we want to do something. We don't know how. And that is where we say the young center, that's where parents come in. That's where teen centers, that's where anybody who's in place to take them and say we will take you from where you are and help you get to second base. We're not the ultimate answer. But we do know that you're simply looking for a way to get to the next step. So the Young Center is a gatekeeper in a way that meets them where they are and helps them to get to the next gatekeeper and then the next gatekeeper and the next gatekeeper. You know that we could probably sit here and tell, you know, <laughs> three or four, because we have. <laughs> we, you know, we can discuss the world and everything. But if you, do you have any idea of how what you do both on screen off screen and just in your personal relationship, how that resonates with people. Do you have a concept of that? Do you, are you aware of the impact that you make in what you're doing? Only because I can see the literal proof of it. Uh, when I see the Michael Tubbs of the world, the Felipe Hernandez, the Zevernus Smith, and I can go on and on. When I see them, because we've been running long enough to where they become adults now, their men and women, Michael Tubbs and his wife, have a child now. So I, I've, I'm able to look far enough to see how they got to second base, third base, and coming home, what they did with it. And that's when I say, wow, we played a small role in that. So keep doing it, Will. When I get tired, Maria, you know, this, it's tough work. It is I, tough. I still work for the studios and the networks, and I work it into my schedule. I, I was shooting in South Africa. We were shooting 15-hour days, and I was working on a film, oh, District 9. District 9. District 9. I had it worked into my contract that I had to have time to work with the young people in Soweto. Wow. I had to. And so going to the schools, I'd be so tired, but I was invigorated by the fact that look at what you've done and realize you're not finished yet. That's what keeps me going to this day. 
It's an honor and a privilege to know you, sir. And I certainly <laughs> hope we have a lot more time together. Yes. But, you know, thank you and congratulations. And I can't wait to read your book and see your screenplay. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate you. All right. And that's a wrap, sadly, on this edition of LA Currents. <laughs>